My name is Malka Singer. I was born in um, outside of Tel Aviv, on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. In what year? Which, uh, 1925. Now, my dad was born in Bialystok, which was sometimes Poland, sometimes Russia. Well, Jews were not treated very well in Russia, or Poland for that matter. At first, I think he was like all the pioneers at the time, cleaning up roads, trying to uh, uh, guard different communities. I know he used to say that at night, they rode on horses with guns. Why do they need to ride around with guns at night? Well, because the Arabs were constantly rioting. There were Arabs who actually in the middle of the night would go and just kill people. Now, they had no electricity. They had no running water in the house. My name is Bilha, B-I-L-H-A, last name Ron, R-O-N. I was born in 1930 in Israel. At that time, we call it Eretz Israel. We don't use the expression of Palestine. My parents came from the Ukraine. Anti-Semitism was so strong, and so they both decided time for them to leave Ukraine. At the time, the water did not flow all the way from the mountain, from the Mount of Ephraim, all the way to the sea because of sand dunes stopped all the exit. That's why so much, so many swamps were in that area. They, they drained the swamps and they planted trees. We were attacked by Arabs when I was three years old and when I was nine years old. There were attacks upon Yarkona, our village. My name is Doron Lux. Oh, my father was six years old when he came to Israel mm -hmm. and my mother was Four years. So this is about 1936. 1936, right. Mm -hmm. When they came to Israel, the system was you would come to Israel. There was no organization that gave you a house or a place to stay. You basically went to relatives. They would close a, 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 a balcony or a corridor and you would stay there for three, four, five months until you get yourself organized and you rent a place and then and, and you start to work and you make some money. And that's how you start your life as a new immigrant. So I'm Danielle Gorion, and I was born in Tel Aviv in 1946. Well, my grandmother wasn't living at Poland when the war broke out. She was living in Vienna with my grandfather. However, Vienna, uh, Austria became Nazi in 1939, a year before the war, in what we call the Anschluss. So the situation in Vienna was already very much um, uh, dire. And by th at that time, the Polish government took away the citizenship of all the Jews that were abroad. So they couldn't even go back to Poland, which was a good thing because they would have been exterminated with the rest of the family in, in Auschwitz. So this was illegal immigration. But there were four months on the Black Sea, on the Aegean Sea, on the Mediterranean Sea, trying to break the blockade and sneak into Israel illegally. And how many people were on that ship? About 700. Yes. And when my parents saw the movie Exodus, they said that's a luxury liner. <laughs> they landed near Gaza someplace and they, um, they waded through the water to break the blockade. How close could they get to land? Because I would think the ship would, would have a, a deep draft. No, people waited with boats. So they had small boats that would take them off? Yeah, not the people came from land to the it ship. Was, it was, was organized, yeah. But this was the year of 1939. In 1942, when the Nazis came to the Ukraine, they killed all of them. My mother did not have a cousin, a, a, a brother, a sister. There were five people in her family. They killed her parents. They killed my, my father's family. They were my, from all this huge family, huge family of generations that lived there, was left one brother. How did you find out what happened? In oh my goodness, how we found out. How we found out. In 1945, the war was over. One day they came together and came a girl 16 years old that escaped from a pit. She came 
And, she, and I was in a meeting when she told the, all these people gathered in Tel Aviv in a one room, and she said to them, you don't have families anymore. They all were buried in mass grave, all of them. Maybe you'll find one here and one there. I don't think, it, she told my mother, there's nobody left from your family. She came from my mother's fa- uh, town. No one left, no one. All the people, men, women, children, all young, there is nobody left from her family. Mm-hmm. All I can tell you, that after that day, my mother's face turned to sadness. I'm named Samuel Rahn, but by the, I was born with a, a Polish name, Rakowski. Born several times in a cattle car. I was four times in a cattle car. Four times? Yeah. And the first time you went in there, what was that experience? I'll tell you something. When you get it in that cattle car, the trouble with this is that you don't know where you're going. Mm-hmm. Whatever they tell you, you don't believe. I think, uh, generally, I think that the cattle cars were the worst suffering of Jews. You know, millions of people were moved in these cattle cars. Uh, but some people were in these cattle cars coming from Greece, from Saloniki, in August, in, in the summer. When they came to Auschwitz, half of them were dead in their cars. They were traveling seven days without water, without food, without this. Half of the people were dead in there. I went from town to town, from city to city, smuggling people over the borders. So we collected people from Austria, from Hungary, from Czechoslovakia, because lots of survivors went back to their homes to look for their family. We had to gather them and send them from border to border to get a ship to Israel. Yes. We took them to, to the Alps. We get up, walked up with them, and the other side, there were others who took them down. So how did you get them, the children, to leave, those people? We, we went from town to town to look. Mm-hmm. We found them. They were crazy, they were already not Jewish children, they already wore crosses, they were some when ad- ad- were adopted by, by the Christians, some children, the other people laughed, he didn't want to give them a map, and we had to take them, and we took them. I just went on from place to place, from deed to deed. Israel in the second half of May 1967 was full of doom and gloom. Okay. I remember our foreign minister, Abba Ibn, who was very well known, mm-hmm. traveling from one civilized country to the other one, France, England, US, every place, and saying, please do something. Nobody did anything. And Egypt basically broke international law, clearly. Because what they did is they closed the Straits of Tehran. To, to add to, to this, on June 2nd, which was a Friday, um, Jordan joined that pact. So now you have Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. So Monday, which was June 5th, Israel started with an attack. Uh, within 40 minutes, there was no Arab Air Force. And the bombing was done on airfields in Egypt, in, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Syria, it, all around. So within 8 o'clock uh, in the morning, by 10 o'clock, there, was no, there, there were like 450 airplanes gone. At the same time, armored forces started to move into the Sinai. By Monday evening, uh, a major part of the operation in, in, in Egypt was was already almost done. In 73, there was a surprise attack, as you know, in Yom Kippur. What, what they do over there is, uh, is when there's, there's like a major holiday, is, you know, a lot of people want to go home. Mm-hmm. And the Syrians they came down a long way. There, there, there was just one battle left, and if they had 
yeah. conquered it and succeeded, they, all the way down to, towards Haifa w was open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this national slogan, or not slogan, the national motto about Masada, mm -hmm. you know, is, is real. And that's the way a lot of Israelis feel. It's real. And, you know, the whole country is saying there will never be another Masada.